hearing. And without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. It is the responsibility of each member seeking recognition to unmute the microphone to speak and mute, unmute, and mute again when not speaking when you're finished. To avoid any inadvertent background noise, I request that every member keep the microphone muted when not seeking recognition to speak. Should I hear any inadvertent noise, any background noise, I will request that members please mute their microphone. Finally, to insert a document to the record, please have your staff email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. Now for my opening statement about today's hearing, which has been coming for a long time. This is our first hearing in about 10 years on emerging and persistent threats to our water and how these threats affect human health and the health of our communities and of our environment. In that time, well, there have been many studies conducted, some very old and new science developed on tracking and treating such contamination. I am glad to have a panel of experts in front of us, well, bef before us on the Zoom, uh, to catch up us up on latest information. Today, we know more about the impact, impacts of contaminants on human health, aquatic species, and the environment. However, we remain there remain many, many gaps in our understanding. At this hearing, we will explore some of the impacts of these contaminants and the roles that federal and the state governments should plan to protect our health and the health of our water resources. Water quality and protection of our surface water resources is not a partisan issue. The Clean Water Act was passed with overwhelming bipartisan support, enough to override the president's veto. I know that the goals of the act are something we can all agree on, even today. To ensure water quality for communities across the nation, we must rely on two separate but very important elements. One, depth of knowledge on the threats to quality and the various tools with which to manage those threats. But also important is continued di diligence uh, research into new and emerging contaminants. During the last administration, we saw unprecedented steps to critically weaken both of these initiatives. The last administration needlessly weakened Clean Water Act provisions over rivers, our streams, our wetlands that provide drinking water to over 117 million Americans. But fortunately for all Americans, the legal action has now been thrown out by the courts. The last administration also slowed water quality enforcement efforts to a standstill, imposing political influences on decisions when or if to enforce the law. Worse still, the administ last administration, EPA actively tried to undermine and silence the scientific and technical expertise and the effectiveness of the agency, putting all of our communities at risk. The current administration has started to restore the critical mission of EPA, which is to protect human health and the environment. However, there is a lot of work to be done to correct previous inadequacies and get our research and water quality management back on track. We must protect our most vulnerable communities from unfettered pollution and the burden of forever chemicals and the harmful, harmful contaminants. Many of the discharges being discussed today come at an extremely high cost to the health of humans and our environment. The cost to the local communities is very high. The high <coughs> cost to the local water treatment plants forced to bear the cost of removal that is the taxpayer. <clears throat> Simply put, we cannot allow upstream polluters to introduce dangerous pollutants into our waterways at the cost of everyday citizens and businesses. We can't tolerate polluter giveaways and comfort profits at the expense of our own environment. Water is critical, too essential to human life to be threatened by any, anywhere or anyone. I do look forward to hearing from a highly esteemed panel on the biggest threats to our water quality and what additional tools we can provide to eliminate these threats. We must be vigilant in protecting our water, including learning current and future threats to human health and the environment, ensuring we meet all these challenges to clean water for all. At this time, I'd like to uh, yield to my colleague, my good friend, Mr. Rouser, for his statements or any thoughts you may have. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, you holding this hearing. And I would also like to thank our witnesses uh, for being with us today. 
Uh, this, <clears throat> this is a very important hearing to examine contaminants of emerging concern, including some plastics, uh, pharmaceuticals, PFAS, and other substances that may pose risk to health and the environment. Like other states, my home state of North Carolina is familiar with these issues. Uh, for many years, PFAS contaminants, known as Gen X, were discharged into the Cape Fear River from industrial facilities upstream. Since then, the state, as well as local governments, have spent millions of dollars and countless hours working to remedy the situation. This challenge is why I've been supportive of legislative efforts to make PFAS a pri priority for EPA so that states and communities can get better support on addressing this matter. These communities rightfully have questions about these chemicals and how they affect the drinking water and environment, which also leads to questions about their effect on personal health, even when at very minute levels. The scientific community is working hard to answer these questions, but there's a lot that we still don't know. More study and research and development are needed to better understand the effects of these chemicals, how widespread they are, which particular PFAS substances are ones of concern, whether those that are of concern are still used in commerce or are now just legacy pollutants, and how they can be monitored and cleaned up. With this gap in knowledge, we need to ensure any regulatory actions or requirements are backed by science and done thoughtfully to protect communities and reduce risk. A good, strong manufacturing base that produces products American consumers want, I believe, can coexist with efforts to improve the environment if done properly. But we must not fly blindly and make emotion-based regulatory decisions rather than using informed science and an understanding of all the risks that are involved. For instance, water and wastewater treatment facilities are in a unique position. They're not responsible for PFAS and other contaminants of emerging concern entering water, water sources, but they are responsible for water treatment and cleaning it up nonetheless. While research is ongoing at this time, there are few treatment methods for removing PFAS from wastewater and even fewer for disposal of PFAS. In the meantime, our water and wastewater utilities face the prospect of significant liability based on how they deal with these substances, even though they did not create them. The options before them are expensive, which can become a great burden for many communities and their ratepayers. As our government moves forward to address PFAS, it is essential we keep in mind the need for further information on PFAS and the economic impacts of cleanup on communities. Looking forward, we should think about the possible effects of substances before they become common in our lives and the products we use, which then also become common in our environment. This is equally true of other substances that might be considered as an emerging concern. We also need to better understand where these substances come from, whether that's a manufacturing facility or from the personal products or medicines we use in our own homes that then are passed along into wastewater after being rinsed down the household drain. And there are many, many of those. There are many household products that will take your breath away if inhaled, in fact, yet they go right down the drain every day. Additionally, shampoos, hair dyes, etc., all go right down the drain, leaving remnants that most surely go into our drinking water. Addressing these downstream impacts beforehand can avoid a lot of health and environmental concerns and expense. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about these and other contaminants of emerging concern and how we can better prepare and educate our communities and hopefully achieve progress in this realm. Again, thank you to our witnesses for being here. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rouser, and that was quite on time. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that a letter from the National Association of Clean Water Agencies in support of provisions from the Clean Water Standards for PFAS Act be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, next, I would like to uh, inter proceed to hear from our witnesses who will testify. I will ask the witnesses to please turn their cameras on and keep them on for the duration of the panel. Thank you for consenting to be here, and you are most welcome. On today's panel, we have Dr. Elizabeth Sutherland, 
former Director of Science and Technology, Office of Water, U.S. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Chris Kennedy, Town Manager, Town of Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Ms. Elise, Elise Granick, I hope I pronounced that right, Ms. Ms. Elise. Associate Professor, Environmental Science and Management Department, Portland State University. Mr. Charles Moore, Research Director, <clears throat> Moore Institute for Plast Pl Plastic Pollution Research. Ms. Katie Huffling, MSRN, CM, M, F, A, A, N, Executive Director, Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment, and Dr. James Pledel, Director of Quality, Water Quality, Hampton Road Sanitation District, Virginia Beach, Virginia. On behalf of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, uh, I'd like, without objection, your prepared statements will be entered into the record and no witnesses are asked to limit the remarks to five minutes. Uh, we will start with Dr. Sutherland. Please welcome, and please, you may proceed. Chairman Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Elizabeth Sutherland. I had the privilege of serving in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency from January 1984 until August 2017, when I retired as Director of the Office of Science and Technology in the Office of Water. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on emerging contaminants and forever chemicals. The Clean Water Act provides adequate authority for states and EPA to address these newly identified harmful chemicals. They have not done so, however, because they lack a national list of priority contaminants in the nation's waters and a coordinated monitoring program by federal, state, and interstate agencies that proactively looks for these contaminants. We are currently suffering from a reactive system that waits for a public health or environmental crisis to occur before we begin monitoring and even considering controls. This happened with the PFAS forever chemicals and will happen in the future with other contaminants if we fail to develop a proactive approach. Congress should require the federal government to develop and maintain a priority list of newly identified harmful chemicals for use by federal and state water monitoring programs. Once monitoring data identify where these contaminants pose risks, EPA and the states can control these discharges to the nation's waters using Clean Water Act authorities. EPA and FDA can also use this information to improve their chemical review programs to prevent new contaminants from entering the environment. Since my retirement, I've been a member of the Environmental Protection Network, a bipartisan organization of EPA alumni volunteering their time to protect the health and welfare of the American people. While my testimony incorporates some information developed by EPM, I am here in my personal capacity. The FY20 National Defense Authorization Act took the first real step towards developing a proactive approach to newly identified contaminants by establishing the National Emerging Contaminant Research Initiative to protect the nation's drinking water quality. Congress should expand this initiative to cover all beneficial uses of the nation's waters because certain contaminants pose a much greater risk to aquatic life, fish consumers, and swimmers than to drinking water consumers. Congress should also require that this research initiative be used to develop and maintain a national list of priority contaminants. Once this national list has been developed, EPA and US Geological Survey must include the priority contaminants in their national monitoring programs and provide technical assistance to state and interstate agencies to add these analyses to their monitoring. EPA should get industry support by using the Toxic Substances Control Act Authority to require industry to provide analytical methods and toxicity assessments for any priority contaminants that they manufacture import or use. Industrial and municipal wastewater treatment plants are often not designed to reduce these unregulated contaminants 
So they enter water bodies through direct discharges, as well as through agricultural and urban stormwater runoff. Control of these contaminants will be most quickly achieved by EPA promulgating national technology-based permit limits for entire industries and by states setting technology-based permit limits for individual industrial facilities within their boundaries. In order to prevent new high-risk man-made chemicals from entering the environment in the first place, EPA must improve the Toxic Substances Control Act's new chemical review program by requiring more comprehensive data from companies seeking to bring industrial chemicals into commerce. EPA and FDA may also need to improve their new chemical review programs for pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetics if these chemicals are found to be frequently occurring contaminants in the nation's waterways. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you today. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sutherland. And I thank all you volunteers for doing such a great job in trying to keep America safe. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, you may proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and other distinguished congressional members. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the effects of emerging contaminants and forever chemicals on a small town. My name is Chris Kennedy. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer in the capacity of Town Manager for Pittsburgh, North Carolina, a quaint town of 4,500 residents in the Piedmont, North Carolina, nestled to the west of Raleigh and southeast of Greensboro. The latter proximity is of utmost importance to Pittsburgh. While we are bolstered by the expansive growth found in the sprouting markets of Wake County and the Research Triangle Park, which tout some of the highest growth rates in the country, we're also downstream of the contributors of PFOS, PFO and 1,4-Doxy in North Carolina's Piedmont Triad. Despite historic and continued prosperity on the industrial front, and we support a robust economy, we are fully enveloped in the negative externalities of this production. In Pittsburgh, the effects of PFOS, PFO and 1,4-Doxy are among the worst in the country. Pittsburgh draws its water from the picturesque Hall River, a tributary into the Cape Fear River. The PFOS levels in the Hall River at our raw water intake experience consistent readings nearing 100 parts per trillion and I've seen levels approaching 1,000 parts per trillion. For context, the EPA has established a non-enforceable health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion for the sum of PFAS chemicals. For 1,4-Dioxin, the EPA has a non-binding health advisory level established between 0.35 and 35 nanogram, micrograms per liter. Pittsburgh, as recently as June 30 of this year, exposed to upstream contamination of 687 micrograms per liter. To be clear, Pittsburgh has no industry that contributes to this concern. We are simply subject to upstream contamination with little recourse to pursue remedy. The effects of continuing contamination on our residents have led to numerous health compromising effects that will allow my counterparts, those in the microbiological and other sciences realm to further define and describe. I can state from a non-medical and non-scientific stance that my residents are afraid of our drinking water and its effects on their short and long-term health. The COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic has only intensified these concerns as we now worry about the efficacy of the vaccines and our internal immune systems are likely compromised by prolonged exposure to these contaminants via our drinking water. Despite our scale of impediments, the town has sought to remedy the problems with advanced treatment measures in our water system. We are currently in the process of implementing a $3.4 million project in our water plant we have titled Fast Track GAC. We have utilized the term Fast Track as we seek immediate action despite funding constraints. The term Fast Track is also indicative of compromises necessary to facilitate the installation of this infrastructure. Even at $3.4 million, this project includes compromises such as serving only one half of our plant capacity. And the infrastructure that is typically housed in, in a structure must be exposed to the elements and piping will be strung across the ground because we simply cannot afford to cover or bury the infrastructure. To afford this project, the town has spent the entirety of our ARPA funds, totaling $1.397 million, as well as the town adopting a 43% increase to our water rates with the adoption of this current year's fiscal budget. Frankly, such an increase in other communities would have the manager relieved of his duties. For further perspective, our, our entire water and wastewater budget in fiscal year 21 was $3.9 million. So it goes without further elaboration that a single $3.4 million project that nearly exceeds our typical operating capital budget is concerning. We have identified future costs to provide advanced treatment to eradicate PFAS, PFO, and 1,4-Doxane to cost between $15 and $20 million in initial capital expense and millions more perpetually in increased operational expense. Our customer base is just over 2,100 individual accounts. 
cannot reasonably burden with its expense. The financial reality and demand to remedies introduced contaminants is simply too great to organically, from a budgetary perspective, address the problem. While I'm not asking for funding in my testimony today as I share my story, I speak to support stricter regulations on emerging contaminants and forever chemicals. I support a common maximal acceptable contamination level for drinking and recreational waters. Treating all bodies of water, both drinking and water sources, dr drinking water sources and recreational waters with equivalent care by eliminating the term recommendation in favor of clear and precise levels of acceptable contamination is what we seek. The better the raw water, the, the more effective and longer lasting the treatment media or membranes. Increased efficacy and longevity reduces operational expense and fewer for future capital expansion. Cleaner water reduces demands on chemicals, filtering, electrical energy, and other costs that escalate quickly, especially in combination. The externalities of added advanced infrastructure are not without their own concerns. For example, GAC using granular activated carbon is typically uh, disposed of via incineration. The disposal methods surely have secondary and tertiary effects that when compounded only, dis only displace contamination for drinking water purposes, entering the system again elsewhere or downstream. In summary, I offer my testimony today to provide the insight of a small town that is disproportionately burdened with the need to react to the injection of emerging contaminants and forever chemicals into our drinking water without clear avenues to afford and manage such infrastructure. I support the consideration of precise, enforceable maximum cont contamination levels, removing the term recommendation from the lexicon and the standards of emerging contaminants for forever chemicals, and the equal application of these MCLs for emerging contaminants and forever chemicals for all bodies of water. Anything contrary to this action negatively affects not only my town of Pittsburgh, but towns and, and cities all over this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. And I'm sure that uh, if others had a t chance to testify, they would say the same thing about the contamination to their water. Uh, uh, their water. Uh, Dr. Granick, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair Napolitano, <clears throat> Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to present to you. I'm a marine ecologist with 20 years of experience conducting field and laboratory research on coastal marine ecosystems, including on emerging contaminants such as microplastics, pharmaceuticals, and pesticides. Emerging contaminants are ubiquitous in marine and freshwater ecosystems, as well as in our bodies. Drinking water extracted from rivers, fish, shellfish, sea salt, and craft beer we consume, Freshwater and marine animals we value for tourism are all exposed to a cocktail of dozens to hundreds of contaminants in our streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans. We are, in turn, exposed to these contaminants. Yet in the United States, our regulatory policy takes a pollutant by pollutant approach with benchmarks set for a very limited number of the thousands of contaminants currently in production and use today. These numerous chemicals can interact synergistically to become more toxic in combination than individually. Therefore, managing a subset of chemicals on an individual basis fails to address how humans and animals experience chemicals in the environment and likely underrepresents human health and environmental effects of multiple contaminant exposure. And some chemical effects are exacerbated by warming water temperatures. Microplastics are, are, are plastics smaller than the width of a pencil and include a large number of different chemical compositions from those in synthetic clothing like fleece jackets and raincoats to polymers used in chip bags, straws, or PVC tubing. Our research findings show microplastics are pervasive in our waterways and aquatic organisms. Here in the Pacific Northwest, in recreationally harvested razor clams and commercially valuable Pacific oysters and pink shrimp, 95 out of 100 individuals have microplastics in their tissues. All black rockfish we've examined contain microplastics. Again, all of these in their consumable tissue. Other studies report microplastics in drinking water, sea salt, craft beer, and honey. So it isn't surprising that a recent study out of New York State found that all infant and adult stool samples collected contained microplastics. Not only are microplastics in plants, animals, and humans, but dozens of studies have now identified harmful effects of microplastic exposure in corals, lobsters, and other shellfish, fin fish, and humans. Deleterious effects range from adverse reproductive outcomes, physical organ damage and altered growth and development to behavioral changes, reduced immune response and inflammation, all of which can affect populations of commercial or endangered species. Since microplastics have been found in human placentas of newborn babies and colon tissue of colon cancer patients, these microplastics may be affecting human health. 
yet no federal regulations currently exist to inform consumers of microplastics in, the, in their food, set safe levels of microplastics in human food items or drinking water, or to limit microplastic release into waterways. Pharmaceuticals are biologically active chemicals manufactured to generate a biological response in the body. Personal care products are hygiene products, toothpaste, soap, sunscreens, cosmetics, identified as contaminants of emerging concern. These compounds together called PPCPs enter rivers, estuaries and oceans after being washed down the drain from industry, hospitals, animal care facilities and households and enter our waterways in large part because there is no regulated disposal process nationally and current wastewater infrastructure does not remove many of these compounds. In Puget Sound, Washington, federally listed juvenile Chinook salmon accumulated 36 different PPCPs in their tissue, some at concentrations higher than in the effluent released from nearby wastewater treatment plants. Pharmaceutical effects on humans can also be observed in animals. For example, fluxetine in the antidepressant Prozac can reduce inhibition in humans and in shore crabs when around their predators, leading to increased loss of limbs and death for the crabs. Some of these chemicals impact wild animals that are endangered of cultural import importance and or critical to recreational and commercial fishing. Pesticides, including herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, and fungicides are widely used in agriculture, forestry, farming by municipalities and homeowners to reduce unwanted vegetation, decrease wildfire risk, and increase yield of target species. About a third of US grown crops use pesticides, which then enter waterways via spray, drift, groundwater, and runoff post rainfall. Over 100 pesticides are documented to cause harmful effects on aquatic plants, animals, human development, and human health, including genetic damage, decreased growth, reduced reproductive output, and behavioral change. In summary, though more multiple stressor studies are needed to understand the full scope of how these contaminants paired with environmental stressors resulting from climate change are affecting freshwater and marine plants and animals. There is ample scientific evidence that these contaminants affect freshwater and marine organisms with potential implications for human consumers. More active management between policymakers and scientists is needed to determine appropriate benchmarks for these chemicals, both individually and in combination with other chemicals to safeguard environmental and human health Benchmarks need to consider how simultaneous exposures to multiple contaminants affect animals, including commercially important and endangered species, as well as public health. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, and I welcome questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Granick. Uh, it's uh, wondering if the manufacturer has found replacements for some of the chemicals. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize Representative Lowenthal to say a few words about Mr. Uh, Moore. Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's, you know, this is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Captain Charles Moore. Captain Moore is the founder of the Al Galita Marine Research Foundation, and he's the research director of the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research. Both of these are located in Long Beach, California. Captain Moore has been credited, and it rightfully so, with the discovery and the early research related to the North Pacific Gyre, or what we commonly known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I've been lucky to have been able to call Charlie my friend for more than 30 years and credit him for my interest and work related to addressing plastic pollution. After early research trips, Charlie would take out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. He would go out on these research trips. He would come back and show me samples of the plastic that he had collected. And he would explain to me all about his findings. This has had and continues to have a profound impact upon me. Charlie, thank you for being here with us today. And I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Moore, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair Napolitano and Ranking Member Rouser and members of the committee and, and Alan. Uh, plastics, the giant molecules that have come to characterize the modern age are not well understood by the average citizen. We Americans love stories of explosive growth that leads to expansion of our economic base. And that plastic story is easily told. We had to manufacture the first plastics to win World War II. 
After the war, new mass produced plastics replaced traditional materials and because of their infinite moldability became the designer's dream that ushered in the throwaway society. And boy, did we throw plastics away. That story of plastic is a bad one. I wish the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's estimate of an ocean half plastic, half fish by mid-century in just 29 years was alarmist propaganda, but it's based on peer-reviewed science. So is the estimate that we breathe in 16 bits of plastic every hour, a credit card's worth every week. Synthetic polymer litter and dust are different from their natural cousins because of their endurance. Even when they break apart and appear to go away, they persist as tiny microplastic pieces. Since I discovered these microplastics in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in 1999, six times as much as the associated zooplankton, I have been writing and lecturing on plastic use and waste. The topic has little political baggage. No one has suggested to me that vagrant plastic is a good thing for our environment, and it would be nice to see more. For today's hearing, my goal is to explain how waste plastics from the molded chair to the crispy chip bag to the broken down microplastic particle constitute serious impairments the land, air, and water quality, public health, our communities, and threaten the health of the biosphere. Every year we make more plastic than the weight of the Earth's human population, and as much as a third of it goes A-W-O-L. For the ocean, a dump truck full goes in every minute. Many plastics are made from harmful monomers such as styrene, vinyl chloride, bisphenol A. A small percentage of these remain as free monomers, even after the majority have been chained together by industrial polymerization, and these free monomers can leach out. Also, the monomer additives in consumer plastics can leach into things that touch the plastic. Flame retardants, UV stabilizers, softeners, colorants, biocides, blowing and foaming agents are mixed into the resin. There may be a dozen or more, and they can be half the weight of the product. Coming into contact with such products allows them to enter the circulatory system. One of the most studies of these endocrine disruptors or gender benders is bisphenol A. BPA was among the EDs selected by the Endocrine Society in a detailed 2012 explanation of how they exploit sensitive hormone systems. BPA and similar molecules derail normal cellular function, organ development, and behavior, especially during fetal and neonatal periods when babies are very sensitive to chemicals that alter hormone signaling. This results in damage to brain development, reproduction, the immune system, cardiovascular system, and metabolism. The volume of laboratory studies on BPA numbers in the hundreds and the list of associated human health problems reads like a catalog of modern Western diseases. The highlight one, changes in mammary glands leading to the rise in breast cancer were viewed as conclusive. Plastic ingestion by whales and seals, fishes and birds, jellyfish, marine worms, bivalves, Corals, said to find the plastic tasty, and zooplankton point to its ability to mimic natural food. Even the terrestrial soils where a common soil arthropod consume plastic, perturbing its gut microbiota. Plastic food does not provide nutrients. It blocks passages, delivers pollutants, causes false feelings of being full, and damages the epithelial lining. These effects have been noted in nine species of fish, four species of mollusks, two crustaceans, two mammals, and two human cell cultures. In a fish study, the microplastics crossed the blood-brain barrier and inhibited feeding behavior. What will they do in our brains? Being insulators, they are sure to interfere with electrical signaling. Plastics were found in the human placenta in four of six women after childbirth, rendering the fetal placental unit vulnerable to adverse effects. Even leafy plants can contain the smallest waste plastic. They accumulate on the roots of the plants and in one study were transported to the leafy parts of thale cress as it grew. Plastic waste is hazardous waste and the Environmental Protection Agency should take action to limit microplastic pollution. The Break Free from Plastic Act of 2021 has critically needed features such as a moratorium on virgin plastic production, minimum recycled plastic content, a national bottle bill and attention to environmental justice implications. We should make sure its funds go directly to cities and counties to build the needed infrastructure. The extended producer responsibility provisions of the bill need to support local decision making. The American Recycling Infrastructure Plan prepared by the National Recycling Coalition, Zero Waste USA, and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance provides guidelines for these investments. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Huffling.
Uh, I noticed that uh, not every plastic is being recycled, so that's an addition to that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Flatley, you may proceed. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Katie Huffin, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. You may proceed, Ms. Huffling. Thank you. Thank you to Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony here today. My name is Dr. Katie Huffling, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I'm also a nurse midwife. The Alliance is the only national nursing organization focusing solely on the intersection of health in the environment. My work in environmental health began early in my midwifery career when I recognized what an important component the environment is to having a healthy pregnancy and healthy babies. I now work with nurses and nursing organizations around the country and globally to address the health impacts caused by environmental toxins. A core part of nursing practice is working to prevent disease. We work every day to help our patients stay healthy. Unfortunately, we now know that exposures to environmental toxins are implicated as one of the sources of rising rates of health issues in children, such as asthma, leukemia, neurodevelopmental impacts such as autism and ADHD, diabetes, and obesity. Environmental exposures make it much more difficult for nurses and other health professionals to do our jobs. So why are environmental exposures such an issue in children's health? Children are not just little adults. They eat more, breathe in more air, and drink more per body weight than adults. They ingest more toxins pound for bound, and due to their hand-to-mouth activities and time spent on the floor, are at increased risk of exposures. And their little bodies are still developing, so they process environmental contaminants differently than adults and may experience more significant health impacts. Besides the pain and suffering experienced by children and families facing health impacts from environmental exposures, there are also significant financial impacts. In the United States, we are spending approximately $76.6 billion every year on environmentally related diseases in children. The average cost for one child with cancer, including healthcare costs and parental days lost from work, is $833,000. Just the loss of one IQ point decreases that child's lifetime earning potential by $11,000 to $15,000. This amount quickly adds up as IQ points are lost and can mean the difference between poverty and middle class for these children over a lifetime. By addressing environmental causes of disease, we have an immense opportunity to improve the lives of children and families across the United States and significantly reduce healthcare and societal costs. As we are seeing with PFAS water contamination and have seen historically with many other chemical exposures linked to human health impacts, we have a failure of regulatory oversight. Chemicals need to be proven safe before being put on the market. When chemicals are pulled from the market only after harm has occurred, our children and families are unwittingly being used as human experiments. Also, the way of testing, of safety testing is currently performed on chemicals does not mirror the way we are all exposed to chemicals in everyday life. Chemicals are usually tested individually. However, none of us are exposed to a single chemical on a single day. Research is greatly needed into the area of these cumulative exposures for regulatory agencies to make appropriate decisions related to the health impacts of chemical exposures. PFAS exposure from water sources is very concerning for the health of infants and children. PFAS can pass through the placental barrier and has been found in cord blood, indicating fetal exposure during pregnancy. It is also passed through breast milk, and if an infant is formula fed, they would be getting exposed to PFAS every time they were fed if the drinking water source was contaminated. An area of great concern to the nurses I work with is the link between PFAS exposure and decreased vaccine effectiveness. I was recently part of the National Academy of Sciences Committee, and I'm sorry, part of a meeting of the National Academy of Sciences Committee investigating guidance on PFAS testing and health outcomes. Over the course of the meeting, it became clear that communities are frightened. Their health providers don't know how to assess for exposures and don't know what to do if an exposure is found. They are frustrated that exposures from water supplies are taking so long to be assessed and addressed. 
and many communities, especially small communities, lower income communities, and some communities of colors are struggling to pay for filtration systems that will remove PFAS from their water supplies. They're wondering why they are being forced to pay for a problem they did not cause. Clean water is essential to health. The Alliance strongly supports efforts that will decrease environmental exposures through our drinking water system and encourages this committee to move swiftly to address these growing areas concern. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Huffling. It's important uh, they also check the uh, imports of the US because we don't test any of those. Uh, Mr. Uh, Plelan. You may proceed. May, what do you need to pronounce your name, please? Certainly. Uh, last name pronounced Pletel. Pletel. Just like metal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're on. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and all members of the subcommittee for the invitation to testify before you today on behalf of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, or NACWA, on the important issue of emergent contaminants. I'm Dr. James Plettel, the Director of the Water Quality Department for the Hampton Road Sanitation District, which provides public sanitary sewer services to 1.7 million people in Southeastern Virginia. I'm honored to be here today to represent NACWA and the more than 340 public clean water utilities the association represents nationwide, who like HRSD are on the front lines protecting public health and the environment every day. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the perspectives of the public clean water utility community and our recommendations for addressing emergent contaminants. Emergent contaminants include a wide array of chemical substances that can be detected in the environment, such as pharmaceuticals, personal care product ingredients, nanomaterials, and other chemicals, including per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, or PFAS. Public clean water utilities do not produce or manufacture these chemicals or use them in the treatment process. Utilities simply receive PFAS in the raw influent that arrives at the treatment plant, which includes a mixture of wastewater streams from domestic, commercial, and industrial sources. Utilities are required to treat the influent they receive in accordance with all appropriate laws and regulations. Clean water utilities were not designed to treat these emergent contaminants, and treatment options are limited and costly. PFAS present significant treatment challenges by their very design as forever chemicals, with most technologies unable to destroy the strong carbon-fluorine bond. Currently, there are no reasonably cost-effective techniques available to treat or remove PFAS in the sheer volume of wastewater managed daily by clean water utilities. HRSD alone treats 55 billion gallons of wastewater annually. For these reasons, source control and eliminating the use of these chemicals in the manufacture of our everyday commercial and consumer products must be at the heart of any fair and cost-effective efforts to reduce PFAS entering the environment. We urge the federal government to advance understanding of the PFAS risk to human health and the environment, and based on improved understanding, take necessary measures to eliminate non-essential uses and reduce PFAS at its source of use. NACWA strongly supports EPA using its authority under the Clean Water Act to evaluate and, as necessary, develop effluent limitation guidelines and pre-treatment standards for industrial categories discharging PFAS-containing wastewater directly or through municipal sewer systems. However, as these standards are developed, there are subsequent burdens placed on clean water utilities, which administer and enforce their local pre-treatment programs. We appreciate efforts by Congress to provide important funding to clean water utilities to help them afford the new costs associated with addressing PFAS through the pre-treatment program. It's important to note that a clean water utilities industrial pre-treatment program will not control or eliminate the domestic inputs of PFAS to the wastewater treatment plant because they originate from the use of everyday household products such as nonstick cookware, personal care products, waterproof clothing, and others. Removing PFAS chemicals from municipal wastewater influent and effluent will not be readily affordable in the near future because the advanced treatment technology required is expensive and there's little benefit to scale of treatment. Large and small systems will experience significant financial burden if required to adopt these technologies. These financial constraints underscore the need to first reduce industrial inputs and non-essential uses of PFAS and consumer goods. Utilities are also understandably concerned about the development of any requirement to meet water quality criteria for PFAS. Unless water quality criteria account for background levels 
cost and the priority of putting upstream industrial controls in place first, the clean water utilities could be faced with a cost and compliance crisis, namely permit limits that simply cannot be met without unaffordable cost. Better scientific understanding of PFAS, bait, risk, and transport is also crucial to help municipalities make sound management decisions with regards to treated wastewater residual solids or biosolids. Increased concerns over PFAS and municipal residuals have appeared at the state level. Some clean water utilities are facing severe regulatory constraints on their biosolids management programs without sufficient scientific study. Clear federal guidance is critical to support the local management of residuals in a safe and cost-effective manner. In closing, as science further evolves on PFAS and how to best protect public health, public utilities stand ready to do our part to ensure the communities we serve are best protected from risk. We look to Congress and the administration to be a long-term partner with us and assist our communities in this shared effort. NACWA thanks you for the invitation to provide this testimony. It looks forward to continuing to work together on policy solutions that protect the health of our communities through the application of risk-based science. That concludes my testimony. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you, Mr. Flettel. It's a great testimony because I think it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to begin to question uh, where all these contaminants are coming from, what we're doing about them, and uh, how we can help address it. Thank you to all our witnesses. We will now have qu questions for you, and we will use the timer to allow five minutes questions from each member. If there are additional questions, we may have additional rounds as necessary. I will begin the questioning, uh, and I, I will give the order. We have Mr. Huffman, Mr. Malansky, Mr. Papas, Mr. Colton following me and uh, my colleagues. Uh, the question for the panel of witnesses, all of you, I'll ask a simple question of the witnesses to start the discussion. A simple yes or no will do. Do you think that Congress and EPA and other agencies are doing all they can to protect human health from all emerging contaminants. I'll start with Dr. Sutherland and then go down the line. Yeah? Absolutely not. Mr. Kennedy? No, ma'am. Mr. Granick, Ms. Granick? Absolutely not. Mr. Moore? No. Mr. Huffing, Ms. Huffing? No, they are not. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Flittle. That's no. Thank you very much. We all agree with you. We think that we require more uh, research and more honest uh, uh, approach to this. Uh, the follow-up question for Dr. Sutherland. You said you don't think Congress and EPA or, and other agencies are doing enough to protect us from the emerging contaminants. What actions would you prioritize Thank you, Chairwoman, for that question. Uh, they really need to build on this National Emerging Contaminant Research Initiative. It's, it's really gotten off to a great start, uh, but it's really right now just focused on drinking water quality. Congress needs to expand the mission of that research initiative and require this national list of priority contaminants to be developed. They also need to require a coordinated monitoring program to look for these contaminants so we can find out where we need to focus our efforts. And then I really think we, we have to have some kind of targeted appropriation that will allow EPA to really expand the tiny little effluent guideline program they have for these technology-based permit limits on industries. I think they only have like 20 people now and they cannot possibly address this. The water quality approach that Jim talked about in his testimony takes years and years to develop water quality criteria and standards and TMDLs to implement. The only fast way to do this is technology-based. Well, do you think that uh, EPA shouldn't be the only agency? Well, absolutely. We need to have the new chemical review programs under the Toxic Substances Control Act and the Pesticide Act really take a look at what they need to do. We have some specific suggestions uh, for the TOSCA program. Right now, they allow, uh, like Gen X, which is certainly a problem in North Carolina, was passed through the new chemical review program several years ago, and now we have this enormous problem from that. About imported. Exactly. 
So EPA needs to improve their new chemical review program under the Toxic Substances Control Act and require more comprehensive data from industry. Thank you very much. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned several areas that require additional research on emerging contaminants, including how these contaminants interact with each other and how they interact with the environmental stressors. Even though additional research is needed, do you think we should wait until that research is done before we begin uh, action on these? Uh, Dr. Granick? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Napolitano. Um, Although there is more research needed, there is ample evidence that action is needed now. We have ample data um, on all of these groups of contaminants indicating uh, environmental impacts, impacts on aquatic and marine organisms and on human health. Uh, so waiting for more data, we could wait for a thousand years for more data. Um, we have enough data to, to act to know these chemicals are problematic and that the interactions of these chemicals are problematic. Um, there have been a lot of research done on it already. Yes. All research. We need to be productive. There's, there's a large, yes, a large body of research, hundreds of papers on, if you look across all of these compounds. And um, Ms. The Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the area of research that's really lacking is looking at how these compounds interact and affect organisms. Um, we have a number of studies, um, but that's probably the area that is, um, has the least amount of research done. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, Mr. Kennedy, I appreciate you sharing the committee story of uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, do you think the federal government is doing enough to keep the water supply of towns like yours, small cities, safe for, you, for use? And your recommendation? Uh, I, I would say no, uh, Madam Chair. The, and my recommendation would be centered upon source reduction. I, I do believe that we need to uh, find the source of these contaminants. I, I do believe that we need to invest in alternatives to PFAS, PFOA, uh, and, and other types of emerging uh, contaminants, uh, find uh, equivalent materials that provide the same benefits as these without the, the negative externalities. Um, and so I, I, we do feel as a small town that we're kind of left on an island. Uh, we, we have a, a significant impediment in terms of finances in order to try to, to eradicate these from our drinking water. And we're struggling to find reasonable solutions despite our creativity um, and, and need uh, to correct those. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Mr. Rouser, you're next. Thank you, Master. Um, thank you, Master. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Pluttle, um, a couple questions uh, for you uh, before I get to some of the others. Um, so why is careful analysis of contaminants of emerging concern uh, so important? Um, and then follow up, uh, what happens if this uh, process is short-circuited? So um, at the basis of uh, most of uh, our, our process in this, in this world of dealing with emerging contaminants is, uh, is monitoring and analytical measurements. And having reliability and analytical measure is extremely critical. Uh, for example, uh, right now there's a proposal uh, out for a particular method, an analytical method to be used to evaluate uh, PFAS chemicals. And uh, the position right now is that the analytical method uh, can be used for a number of matrices, biosolids, water, uh, what have you. Uh, the problem with that in its current state is that uh, it's only been done in uh, its uh, performance has only been established in a single laboratory, and we really haven't had a chance to see what that performance looks like. So at the same time, EPA is recommending that uh, we start to use this method uh, as we make measurements out in the environment, make measurements in effluent, influence, so have you. So we need to have reliability because if we're going to do this within a permit regulatory program, there are liabilities associated with this information. And I personally sign hundreds of discharge monitoring reports every year, citing the truth and accuracy of the information that's submitted to the state, in this case, Virginia. 
And to do that for a method that's only been shown uh, to perform in a single lab uh, falls, falls far short of what we normally expect for analytical methods. So the foundation of uh, this program, this approach really does depend on analytical measurement. And we have lots of different universities and research labs across the country that are using different methods. Uh, it's extremely important when we start to talk about regulating compounds that uh, the, the foundation of that, that whole process, the analytical measurement, it, we're sure that the information is reliable so that when permit actions and legal liability that comes along with those permit actions are defensible, uh, we know that we can go back to that data and that data is defensible. So the analytical measurement is critical. Did I answer all of your question? Yes, and uh, following up on that, uh, so what, what type of impact does this have uh, for ratepayers? Uh, right, so if we, uh, for example, start to take some measurements and uh, those measurements don't have the certainty uh, that we believe they do, and we're going to make decisions on whether we should install a new treatment technology at a wastewater treatment plant to perhaps address that, the compound or the group of compounds, that's gonna increase the cost of treatment and that cost is gonna be translated to the rate payer. So we need to be sure that the information that we're using is reliable in deciding what technologies will be installed, whether it's even necessary or not. So we're relating data back to toxicity information, impact information that we have in the literature. It's all very important for us to make sound decisions for the ratepayers so that the outcome that will result from us installing some type of technology is going to be the outcome that we're all hoping for. There are 45 uh, seconds left here, and this is for anyone on the panel. Um, has anyone uh, done any kind of economic analysis of the impact to consumers and users of the products that contain these various uh, CECs? And then a uh, follow-up question too, uh, what do you replace these chemicals with? Uh, you know, on the one hand, we want a strong manufacturing base in this country. Uh, on the other hand, we want to make sure that we're protecting the environment as well. We'll just have a few seconds if anyone has a quick answer. I guess there's not a quick answer. That's part of, <laughs> that's part, part of the value of this hearing is uh, drilling down on this because obviously if we end up, uh, if you end up banning certain uh, uh, chemicals, uh, that affects the nature of the product that you are uh, producing that consumers want, and obviously there needs to be some type of uh, replacement in order to uh, produce those products. So anyhow, just a fundamental question that we've got to uh, contend with. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we have a rights and complaints that APA is overreaching, not how they are trying to protect our children and our families. Uh, Mr. Huffman, you're next. You may proceed. Thank you, Mad Madam Chair. Thanks for uh, holding this important hearing, and I want to thank the witnesses for their insights. I have worked in the water world for almost my entire career, going back to my time on uh, my local water board. And uh, I certainly have my share of opinions on how we can rise to this challenge that others have described, and making sure that uh, we address emerging contaminants and these forever chemicals so we can protect our uh, health and environment. But I want to start with asking uh, Dr. Sutherland a little bit about biosolids. I know EPA recently uh, awarded four grants for some research on the fate and transport of PFAS uh, and other constituents in biosolids. And so, Dr. Sutherland, um, with your experience at EPA, how would you expect the results of this research to support future rulemakings uh, and inform the work of EPA in that area? So we, I absolutely expect that the results are going to show we need to have controls on PFAS through the pretreatment program so that the utilities, as Jim Plettle was just saying, won't have to bear the cost of all the treatment of PFAS coming into these uh, municipal treatment plants. I'm convinced that the biosolid study is going to show, we already know from Decatur, Alabama experience, that biosolids are gonna be concentrated with these forever chemicals. 
And that in turn really eliminates the really wonderful beneficial use of biosolids, you know, that all of us depend on, not just for, you know, good use of that product, but also for really defraying the cost from municipal treatment plants. Yeah. Thank you for that. Another reason to, to get upstream to the source uh, of these contaminants and do something about that. Uh, Dr. Plettle, I will go to you next. Uh, your testimony uh, brings the perspective of a clean water utility that's on the front lines of dealing with these problems. I think people forget uh, that you have to deal with everything we uh, flush down the drain. I, I once did a bill on the problem of flushable wipes. Uh, you know, companies come up with a product that they think can be flushable and it might make it down the toilet, uh, but it clogs up wastewater systems and causes all sorts of havoc further downstream. And, and that's just one of many ways in which uh, you have to contend with the back end of these problems. Um, and so I agree that uh, polluters, not ratepayers, should really bear the bulk uh, of the cost of controlling things like PFAS uh, pollution. Uh, and as uh, someone downstream of this, uh, let me ask you to speak to how wastewater agencies uh, are the passive receivers of these problems, and uh, what are some ways that EPA and other agencies can do more to help? Are you there, doctor? Did we lose Dr. Plittle? I'm here. Oh, sorry. I'm here. Yes. I wanted to show support for uh, uh, something that Dr. Sutherland said is about the uh, Toxic Substances Control Act. And I think we could do a much better job on the front end of this process, a little bit more accountability uh, on the part of agencies that want to introduce products into the uh, environmental stream, if you will, in the United States. And, uh, and, and think about a little bit more about not just uh, initial uh, exposures and possibilities, but long-term, especially for some of these chemicals that do not degrade readily. So I think we could do a much better job on the front end, even before our consumers, our public use these products, making sure that we understand what's going to happen to those chemicals once they are released from each home or each commercial business. So we need to do a better job there. Would you agree that uh, an obvious place to start would be in products that don't have to have these chemicals? And would you support efforts to phase out non-essential uses of PFAS, for example, in everyday household goods? Yes, that was actually part of my statement that um, the, the two places we should focus on obviously are where chemicals are being produced. And, and then second, where those where those chemicals are actually being used in products. Thanks, and in, in the few seconds I have left, I'd like to ask Dr. Sutherland uh, about how EPA can do more through TSCA to make sure that companies don't bring the next new emerging contaminant into, Congress, uh, into commerce. Uh, what else can we do with TSCA and other laws? So the, actually the new TSCA amendments gave EPA a really important role about doing a safety evaluation before the chemical enters commerce. In the old TSCA, we had to wait until we had some horrifying problem and then we could <laughs> try to, to take the thing out of commerce. So what we find is a real need for EPA to use, which they did not do in the previous administration, all their authorities to require adequate data from the chemical company asking to bring a new chemical into commerce so that they can make a good, reasonable safety decision. Uh, we find that that was not done frequently in the previous administration, and that needs to be fixed. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Uh, Mr. LaMalfa, you're next. Mr. LaMalfa? There you are. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to defer a couple rounds here, please. Then we'll go on to uh, Mr. Garrett Graves. Garrett Graves? 
Okay, we'll go on to Mr. Malinowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to, to all the witnesses. Um, so uh, un unlike Mr. Huffman, I can't claim to be a, a lifelong expert on the issue that we are discussing today, but I've listened very carefully to all of the witnesses. Um, I've also consulted in recent days with my senior policy advisor, John Oliver of HBO, who, who did a, uh, a wonderful presentation on, on this. We, we probably should have had him uh, as one of the witnesses today. And, and I have, I, I really wanna start with, with a broad historical question for, um, for Ms. Ms. Sutherland first. And, and that is how did we get here? After all, this is not a new issue. Um, if we look at PFAS, for example, we, we know that the companies that produce products like Teflon, DuPont, um, chief among them, uh, knew about the dangers, the extreme risks posed by these chemicals going back to, I guess, at least the, the, the early 1990s, which means that the scientific community was aware, was doing studies and reports. Um, from your perspective, as, as somebody who spent many, many years at EPA, what is it about our system of monitoring and regulating these kinds of chemicals that causes it to fail for so, for so long, even when the scientific knowledge is there? So let me just start with just a little historical uh, aspect. The old TOSCA did require us to show a problem before we could take action on a chemical. And there is a lot of protection for the chemical industry from confidential business information. So we were really hamstrung, and that's part of what John Oliver was pointing out last night or Sunday, is that we did not have the studies that the industry had. Uh, there was no transparency or sharing of that information. The new TOSCA gives us all kinds of new authority uh, to first, before you even allow a chemical into commerce, to require adequate data from the industry. Uh, when it's a confidential business information, uh, we cannot share it as openly with the public, but certainly within the agency we can. And I just saw um, actually today, an announcement that EPA is going to start a whole new database with all the studies that they can find on all 9,000 of the PFAS chemicals and make that publicly available. So transparency and the new authorities under TOSCA will be able to cure these problems that John Oliver so <laughs> brilliantly exposed uh, in his show. Okay. When, what, what about the the problem of, um, you know, I, it seems to me we're still there with the, the, the wide variety of PFAS chemicals that we're kind of, we're, we're, we're approaching this one compound at a time, right? Where one particular um, variety of PFAS is shown to be harmful or toxic. So hopefully we, we ban that, but then what stops the industry from just moving on to a similar um, substance that has not yet gone through the rigorous testing. Um, are, are we always going to be one, one or two steps too late? Well, the, how do you think? So, and, and I did want to respond to um, uh, Representative Rouser on this, but I was too intimidated by the time limit. Um, the issue is uh, really we do have, because of the pressure on PFAS, we've already developed all kinds of safe alternatives for firefighting foam and for certain types of food packaging. We already have corporate action actually saying that they will no longer buy these PFAS contaminated products. And that in turn has a big marketplace. So, so there is enormous innovation in the chemical industry that would allow them to come up with safe alternatives. We just have to use the authority we have to crack down on the ones we know are causing problems. And I'm convinced the Biden administration is gonna use the TOSCA authority to treat whole groups of chemicals as a category that can then be run through the TOSCA process of regulating them. The question is, how long are you willing to wait for those categories to complete that minimum seven year process? It would be a lot quicker for Congress to ban 
non-essential uses of PFAS than to wait for this TOSCA process to take place. And so we should. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Malinowski. Next is Ms. Gonzalez Colon. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, 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 can, can you hear me now? You're on. Okay. I can hear you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my question will be uh, to uh, Sutherland, uh, if you are available for me. Um, Dr. Sutherland, uh, in, in um, you. Um, it has known that there are uh, carcinogens, carcinogens uh, in groundwater. Uh, should the EPA have removed regulatory guidelines for contaminants in some wells that people utilize for drinking water? Okay, so the authority that EPA has for setting drinking water standards applies to public water systems uh, that have to have a certain number of users to be eligible for drinking water standards. All these individual private wells, of course, we would want them to meet the water quality and drinking water standards that we have set for the community water systems. But really, EPA does not have the authority. We'd have to work with local health departments to try to ensure that these individual private wells are meeting those standards. The second question I, I, I need to know is that should, should the federal government uh, provide further testing in the instance of private wells uh, when they are located near uh, super, super fund sites? So under the Superfund program, we have lots of authority uh, to require the responsible party for the contamination to provide safe drinking water for the residents. And of course, if it's an orphan site where there is no uh, viable responsible party, EPA will do that. So that's why you will see in many of these cases, they will be giving bottled water to people or they will be putting uh, filtering systems on each individual household's uh, water well in order to provide them with the safe drinking water. So we do have that authority. So the, the question uh, I'm making is, if you fail to study a specific source or route of exposure, uh, could risk uh, be adequately, uh, adequately uh, determined, determined? Sorry, I didn't hear that. If you fail uh, to study a specific source or a specific route of exposure, uh, could the risk be adequately uh, adequately uh, be determined? I'm sorry, I can't hear. It, hypothetically, if one of my constituents drinks well, well water, uh, but the federal government assumes that no one is consuming safe water in, in, in their health risk assessments, um, could the federal government adequately, uh, adequately assess the risk? So um, we try to do risk assessments when we're uh, dealing with a, a contamination cleanup. And usually if there are private wells involved, we actually want to do the monitoring, the real monitoring for where those wells exist. We don't just assume that they're all meeting the national drinking water standards. We actually get uh, information from that specific geographic area where we, where we suspect there's a contamination problem. The reason I, I'm making this this question is, uh, uh, and I would like, Madam Chair, to I would like to submit a 2020 PF, PFAs reports for Vieques, which concluded that residents of Vieques don't drink uh, from private wells in Puerto Rico. However, uh, just this year, the mayor of Vieques stated in the Natural Resources Committee in June of this year uh, that residents do in fact uh, drink from wells on the island. Um, and I will, I would love to submit that uh, for the record, Madam Chair, if you uh, are available. Yes, ma'am, so ordered. Thank you. The, the, the reason I'm making this question is, is, is to, um, you know, I said they're near a Superfund area. Uh, they, people 
said at that time that they were not drinking water from, from uh, the wells uh, in, in the area. Now the mayor established that, yes, they do. Uh, so that was the reason of my question. Uh, you got any comment on that? No, you, you actually need site-specific data from those wells before you can uh, assume that they're safe. I mean, it sounds like there there's a high chance that they're highly contaminated. Thank, thank you, Director. I'll yield back. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Appreciate your questions. Uh, next would be Mr. Papas. You are you may proceed. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and to the ranking member for holding this hearing today. I appreciate uh, the expertise and the comments of our panelists here about. These important issues. I actually just came from an event in my district. It was a roundtable conversation with EPA Administrator uh, Regan, as well as uh, concerned citizens in a community that has been contaminated with PFAS by an industrial polluter. This has been going on for years. I've got hundreds of households in my district that are receiving bottled water right now as they await a safe drinking water hookup. Uh, people are very concerned about what this means for their health, um, you know, what they're able to do in their own homes and on their property. And so we know that this issue is, is not just uh, emerging for um, our communities. Uh, it's one that is well studied, uh, where we are aware of the dangers of PFAS, but yet we haven't seen the kind of regulation we need at the federal level uh, to move us forward. Now, our state has um, put in place some important regulations, some aggressive regulations when it comes to PFAS and drinking water specifically, uh, but we just can't allow states to figure this problem out on their own. Uh, we really need to leverage um, the expertise, uh, the research, and the regulatory power of the federal government to make progress on this. So I know we're awaiting um, a roadmap coming forward from EPA to help us uh, you know, realize these next steps. I think the administrator was pretty clear today that uh, he wants to move forward as quickly as possible. And that's maybe my first question. And maybe I could turn to Dr. Sutherland first. Um, could you talk a little bit about how long it takes EPA to decide whether an emerging contaminant should be regulated and how Congress can potentially help EPA make these determinations faster. My concern here <clears throat> is that we're gonna be two, four, six years down the line and not have in place the kind of um, regulations we need to be protecting people, both from the legacy contamination that's out there in districts like mine, uh, as well as active contamination that's ongoing. So if you have any thoughts about um, how we can speed that process up and, and what that looks like moving forward, I think that would be helpful for us. Yes, I, um, this is a huge issue that you know we've had with since the beginning of time, and that is if you don't know to, you should monitor for it, you're not ever going to look for it, and then you're never going to find it. And so the system we have now is fully reactive. We have to have some horrifying crisis either you know, all the fish are killed or people are deathly ill, uh, something that would cause you to then finally monitor uh, and check for where there could be pollutants that you were not previously aware of that could be causing this public health or environmental crisis. So I think the only way to fix this, and, and that's what I tried to focus on in my comments, we need to have a national list of priority contaminants and a coordinated monitoring program from federal and state agencies that continually looks for these things and then finds them before the horrifying crisis occurs so that we can then begin to uh, come up with control mechanisms or remediation uh, mechanisms of some kind. Well, thanks for those comments. I, I um, support that approach. And I'm wondering about um, some legislation that I've introduced. It would. Uh, help make these determinations when it comes to PFAS and the Clean Water Act, um, issuing um, regulations uh, under that Clean Water Act. And I'm wondering, um, the legislation also looks at deadlines. If you think legislative deadlines for EPA, would it all be helpful um, in uh, kind of moving the agency forward? So deadlines are deeply problematic on an agency now that is the smallest it's been since the 1980s. Um, I was particularly pushing in my testimony for an increase in the effluent guideline program. They're the guys that do the um, technology-based permit limits for entire industries. They're down to 20 people right now, and they cannot possibly handle 
all the various industries that are discharging PFAS right now. So to put deadlines in now when the agency is in such a, a critical condition is really not going to be helpful because they literally do not have the human capital uh, to carry these things out on any kind of tight deadline. We need to beef up the staff, train them, and then we can worry about having tight deadlines. Well, thanks for those thoughts. And I, I think as we take a look at the roadmap, um, I'm hoping it's going to come with a, a set of recommendations for how we can best support the agency and give it the resources it needs uh, to move with great speed, um, because this is a problem, uh, as far as most of my constituents are concerned, that should have been addressed yesterday. Um, with that, I see my time's expired, so I'll, I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. It might, we might have a second round going, but I'd like to call Mr. Rouser next, but before I do, next are Mr. Cohen Stanton, Mr. Ms. Norton, Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Rouser, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate uh, you let me uh, go a, a second time before I have to head to the uh, airport uh, soon. Um, Dr. Granick, I was uh, intrigued with uh, some of the comments in your, uh, in your uh, testimony. And uh, if I'd like for you to elaborate, uh, you know, what sort of items uh, do you find contaminants of emerging concern in? Uh, and I go back to my original um, uh, experience uh, with Gen X when I first heard about it. Uh, we had a meeting uh, down in Wilmington, North Carolina uh, with uh, the governor and the, and the state secretary of health and human services. And we were talking about Gen X and PFAS and PFAS. And, and I got to thinking about it and I was like, well, you know, how many emerging contaminants, you know, are there? Uh, shampoos, dyes, everything that we use every day. There are household cleaners that we use that uh, if you happen to open it and, and you get a strong whiff of it, it'll take your breath away. All this stuff goes into the drain or down the drain on a continual basis, day after day after day. And uh, you, you mentioned some of that or a lot of that in your, in your testimony, and I'm just curious uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, talking about some of those items and what they are, uh, what consumer products are we seeing these uh, contaminants uh, turn up in, and uh, you know, what do we use those uh, substances for? Um, thank you. Um, for the question. Um, I, if I understood correctly, I think you were asking what or what animals they're found in as well as what kind of compounds. Is that correct? Well, you had a wide variety of um, uh, or layout of a wide variety of uh, influences of the compounds. Uh -huh. and I just thought maybe you want to um, address that a little bit. And, and I'm, I'm just trying to learn too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we when we start looking um, as Dr. Sutherland mentioned, when we start looking in the ocean or in freshwater um, at what organisms have these compounds, what animals, we see them in fin fish. So we see many of these compounds in Chinook salmon. Uh, we see them in um, shellfish like clams and oysters. Um, and we see effects, as I mentioned, um, that again, vary by compound. Um, but we see reproductive effects on reproduction and development. Uh, we see effects on re immune response, right? Which is, as um, one of the other speakers mentioned, is, a pro is problematic for, um, especially during COVID, since we know that reduced immune response can affect your, um, the effectiveness of vaccines. Um, when we, when we went to your question, I think about um, what kind of compounds we're seeing. Um, we're seeing a number of compounds that are in household cleaners, as you mentioned. Um, so there are a set of um, compounds that we see um, called alkyl phenols um, that are surfactants in cleaners. Um, alkyl phenols are used both in household cleaners like shampoos and soaps and laundry detergent and dishwashing detergent. Um, but they're also used actually as surfactants in um, uh, pesticide and herbicide mixtures applied to agricultural and forestry uh, lands. Um, and so those get applied sometimes aerially or ground applications to land and can get washed into waterways as well. Um, we see a number of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So things ranging from um, triclosan, which is an uh, antibacterial and antibacterial soap, um, to caffeine, which we consume um, you know, in our coffee and tea. Um, and we see a number of antibiotics like azithromycin or erythromycin, um, et cetera, um, as well as some legacy contaminants um, and, P and PFAS. 
chemicals. So, so how many emerging contaminants are there? Uh, the, what, the range of things that you just described is basically what we all use every day. Um, it, it, it's really, when you drill down, the more you drill down on this, the more, uh, the more expansive, uh, the more universal uh, you see how, uh, you know, just how expansive all this is. So, yes. you know, when, you, when, it, when it comes to smart regulation and, and having a balanced approach here, uh, how, do, how do we handle this if there are so many different uh, uh, emerging compounds, uh, you know, out there of concern? Um, yeah, so my expertise is definitely not in the regulatory side of things. Um, Dr. Sutherland mentioned um, classes of compounds, and I do think that that is an approach to take. Um, but yes, there are hundreds of emerging contaminants that we don't yet um, regulate or have any sort of benchmarks um, for what levels are safe for aquatic organisms or for human health. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, this the cumulative impact is frightening, really it is. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair, and indeed it is frightening for I am a lifelong, and that's longer than many, uh, user of Teflon products, thinking that I was saving myself calories and I'm killing myself, uh, apparently. Uh, Ms. Bannon talked about too fast, and uh, your testimony states Federal regulations do not inform consumers of microplastics in their food. Somebody, something to There is background noise, but I have to go. You're cutting out, sir. I'm cutting out. In and Ms. out. Granick, Ms. Granick, can you hear me? Hello? I think I can hear you now. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tell me about PFAS and, and microplastic releases in our waterways and our bodies. Should I be concerned about dying very soon because I do have done Teflon all my life and use certain shampoos? So most, my research actually is not specifically on human health, although many of the studies uh, on animals, um, we find that the effects can translate to human health. Um, my research doesn't focus on PFAS, so I can speak less to PFAS. Um, what I can say is that we are exposed to microplastics on a daily basis, both in the, when we drink from, you know, water bottles, um, non-reusable water bottles, um, we're breathing microplastics in, in when we breathe air. Um, microplastics are so pervasive that they're in our shellfish, they're in our beer, they're in our sea salt, um, they're in our water. If our water comes from, um, up, for, if, the, if there's upstream municipalities um, that are releasing treated wastewater into a waterway and then a downstream municipality takes in that water as drinking let's take, water. Let's take it as a given that there, there are a lot of places. What can we do as government officials and laws to see to it that we protect the human species? Great question. So I think that we need regulations on uh, release of microplastics into waterways and benchmarks for what is safe in drinking water and perhaps in food. So we have regulations of um, levels of mercury, for example, that are safe in, food, in fish, um, but we have no benchmarks for levels of plastics that are safe for consumption, for example. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Huffling, do you knowledge of PFAS and, and its harms on human beings. Ms. Huffling, did you hear me? I'm sorry, I did not. I, I, yeah, no. do, you, do you have knowledge of PFAS and its harmful effects on human species? Yes. Um, so... Scare I think it's um, scary. So um, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which um, studies um, the health and well-being of the U.S. population has found pretty much everyone in the U.S. has PFOS in their body. And what we are now learning about PFOS is that it's exposure is associated with a number of health in fact, impacts, um, such as thyroid impacts. It can um, impact birth with pre um, associations with preterm birth decreased effectiveness of vaccines, which is very concerning um, as a public health professional. Um, it's also associated with some types of cancer, such as testicular cancer, 
as well as um, elevated cholesterol levels. And you know, many of these are things that we're seeing rising rates of throughout the United States and can be incredibly costly to treat. So what can we do to, to, to mandate that they're limited in their application on foods and affect human species? Right, so um, you know, food is an important source of PFAS exposure in humans. And so uh, reducing its use in food containers and food processing plants is important. Um, moving away from Teflon-based um, pans and things, you know, using things like cast iron pans that ha have a more um, natural uh, non-stick capability without the addition of these um, additional chemicals. Um, so there are ways that all of us can move away from these things, but I think regulatory-wise, um, moving away from its use in food packaging and processing is a really important way that uh, we can reduce exposures in humans. Is using plastic containers in your microwave dangerous? Yeah, heating up plastic in your microwave can definitely um, increase the chances of um, different chemicals within that plastic to leach into your food. So definitely not um, recommended that you uh, microwave plastic. Well, some of them that I have say they're microwave safe. Should there be some type of more clear delineation on the product that they're you're risking your health? Definitely. I think, um, you know, again, it's, it's an issue with the way our regulatory system works. Um, you know, that we're not required to be saying in many products what the different ingredients are, um, how they may be leaching out into the human body or into our food. So um, I think it's definitely an area that there can be improvement. Thank you very much. And I've learned a lot. I watched the John Oliver tape, but, and that's scary as heck. And I go to go to my grave, I'll be emanating PFAS or something, chemicals, it's dangerous. And uh, the PFAS legislation has taught me a lot. When I first saw it, I thought it had something to do with Flomax, but I now know it's worse than that. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Mr. Lovemalfa, you're next. You're on, sir. Proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think when we have this discussion here, ultimately, and I've seen it here in California, the move will be made to ban plastic products that use, are used for containers. Um, so have at it. But uh, they'll have to be replaced with glass, not be replaced with aluminum or stainless steel or other products in order to hold fluids, hold uh, other products that are re require shipping. And so when you do all this, you, heck, you maybe even wooden barrels. So if you wanna go back to these things, they're gonna be heavier, they're gonna be uh, different, more complicated to produce and to put our products in that people use every day. It'll be a lot different game when you ban plastics like this. And so I, I have no doubt there'll be legislation to push this. If it doesn't come from our California legislature, it'll be coming from certain folks in DC. So it's, it'll be an interesting discussion going down the line. We can certainly improve how we do things, but uh, I think the banners will be out to do this. So I also find it fascinating in the conversation here, uh, it was mentioned that uh, we're using our kids as an experiment. So um, that's, that's amazing with the mandates coming down on the pike and the pharmaceutical thing, where kids under the age of 12 are gonna be forced to get certain vaccines that have been untested on them. So that all said, We'll get back to the focus here. Now in my Northern California district here, we've had one and a half million acres worth of uh, forest fires releasing all sorts of stuff into the air, ultimately into our streams, our rivers, our, our, uh, our water, our stored water in our lakes. And so uh, we battled year after year to try and get forest management that makes sense. So all this ash, all this byproduct does not end up in our streams and the water. So you wanna talk about an impact. That's gonna be a big one very immediately. And so we do a little about it. The Forest Service is unable to get out of its tracks due to either legislation stopping it or lawsuits. So I, I fret for that because our water supply in California is already in peril. And uh, we have folks trying to remove dams to get rid of the uh, threat to uh, fish supposedly up on the Klamath, whereas the, the, the situation there isn't really about fish. And we don't mention the 20 million cubic yards of silt and material behind those dams that can get into our waterways and we'll get into the waterways. So we gloss over all that and go after this. It's, it's really pretty discouraging in this issue. So 
But what we have is uh, in California and the West, uh, a lot of a lot of things have gone on with mining in the early days, and so we end up with things like the WOTUS rule under the Obama administration, and it's it went way too far in regulation, I believe, and a lot of us in the West believe in farming and agriculture. So what what is it we're really looking at here with with the regulations coming down on the pike, whether it's on the plastics or in water in general? I'd like to ask Dr. Plettle about that. You know, I'm sure you've had some intense reaction to re regulations on policy before. So can you give us some detail on the best practices that our officials will be looking at to engage with landowners in the private sector on how to re reduce the pollution without immediately making an enemy out of the folks that are out there producing our crops and uh, our mined products and our timber that we need to be uh, you know, harvesting instead of burning 2 million acres of each year? What do you think of that, Dr. Plettle? I, I certainly know the Biden administration has announced that they uh, are already underway with a very uh, comprehensive nationwide approach to talk to all stakeholders about where they should go next in protecting waters of the U.S. And of course, this is, you know, the fundamental issue of the Clean Water Act. Where do the NIFTES permits and the uh, approaches apply? What waters, what wetlands are covered? And to be 50 some years after the passage of that act and still not have clarity on that is really uh, hurting the program. So, yeah, Dr. Plattle, it's being reinter re, uh, reinterpreted to mean that every every pond that a, a farmer has on his ranch, his his irrigation ditches, his uh, drainage ditches, that those have, are somehow now in the scope of what was passed in the early 70s as being completely different. Do you have any idea how many millions of acre feet of water being flushed out of our stored areas and taken away from agriculture in order to flush the Bay Delta? The Delta is being um, is being uh, flushed with so much of the water that could be used for people in agriculture instead because of municipalities that have overflow from their sewer systems all surrounding the uh, San Francisco Bay Area and even coming from upstream a little bit. Municipalities, when they when their sewers overflow, Water has to be taken from other people in order to make that to uh, make that equation come out somehow a little bit better on the parts per trillion, parts per billion or million in the water in the in the Bay Area. So what we're talking about here is an appropriation of water taken away from people making good production of it because others are polluting with it. What do you think about the the need to do more on the San Francisco Bay Area with those municipalities surrounding the Bay? So what I will say is uh, EPA cannot by any rulemaking take away all the many agricultural exemptions that are already provided for in the Clean Water Act. So the Clean Water Act already envisioned uh, your concern. And so they told the agricultural community, you don't have to apply for any permits on your farm ponds, on your irrigation ditches. You don't have to uh, worry about, you know, uh, gullies or puddles that form during stormwater. All of those I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt. EPA, in concert with the Army Corps of Engineers, is doing that very thing in Northern California. They're making people get permits to plow their land to change crops because of some waterways the United States interpretation that they're so far getting away with. So the Clean Water Act provides a full exemption from all farmland that's been previously farmed. Uh, so it's only if you want to move into agriculture in an area that has never been farmed before, like a, you a need, native You need to let wetland. the EPA and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers Mr. know Lamofa, about your that time they're is up. enforcing otherwise. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Sutherland. The next we will go to Mr. Stanton, then followed by Ms. Norton and Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. I want to thank each of the witnesses for your very important testimony. In the desert southwest, climate change has caused a long-term drought, and the reservoirs that supply water to the region, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, are at historically low levels, threatening the long-term sustainability of this critical water source. Southern Arizona in particular is heavily dependent on water delivered from the Colorado River by way of the Central Arizona Project. Unfortunately, they are finding PFAS in groundwater, their only other reliable potable water source 
near the Air Force Base and Air National Guard installation in Tucson, and it is spreading throughout the community. As a result, the drinking water aquifer that serves over 700,000 people is at risk. To add to the complications, Tucson is a closed basin water system with little to no surface water that can flush PFAS out of the basin, making the community even more vulnerable to PFAS contamination. The longer we wait to treat the PFAS contamination, the more at risk our water will be and the more it will cost to clean up. And most importantly, PFAS contaminated water is water the city of Tucson cannot use, even in the middle of this historical drought. In addition to Tucson, thousands living near Luke Air Force Base in the Phoenix metropolitan area have had to use bottled water for drinking and cooking for most of this year after high level of PFAS was found in their tap water. The Infrastructure Investments and Job Act provides federal funding for the treatment of PFAS. This is a start and I look forward to working with my colleagues here on the committee to do even more to address these, this issue that affects one of our most precious resources, our water. I have a couple questions for Dr. Sutherland. Dr. Sutherland, what else can be done to address PFAS contamination in areas that are particularly vulnerable due to long-term drought? Yeah, I think uh, the entire Superfund program had an initiative that was suspended during the previous administration, but they're picking back up on now, which is to evaluate every Superfund uh, site for its vulnerability to climate change impacts. And that could be drought as in you know, the hellish situation you have, or it could be flooding. Uh, in the Northeast. And so they are off and running now on really trying to update all their evaluations of their contaminated sites. That's also going to be a major initiative of the Biden administration at EPA to make sure every program, air, water, uh, land, incorporates environmental justice concerns into their evaluations of new projects, not just the old ones like Superfund sites, but any new evaluations they do of community threats. Dr. Sutherland, what additional resources are needed to expedite the investigations and reme remediation of PFAS in communities like Tucson? So I, I think uh, Congress has looked at special appropriations already for PFAS. I know they are working very carefully with the Department of Defense to make sure the Department of Defense addresses their contamination problems. I think they're far enough along now on DOD, they've done a lot of monitoring and they know where their problems exist. And now they just need the funds and I think they've got a good start on that uh, to start the cleanup. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. I'm a former mayor of a city, so I have a lot of respect for town managers and city managers. Uh, my city manager saved my bacon many times when I was uh, mayor of Phoenix. In your testimony, you discussed the challenges and efforts your community has faced in remediating PFAS in the drinking water. As I noted, the infrastructure bill includes investments to address PFAS in drinking water, specifically $5 billion to help small and disadvantaged communities, $4 billion to help drinking water utilities remove PFAS from their supplies or connect well owners to local water systems. You did address it in your earlier testimony, but I'll give you a chance to add some if you'd like. Uh, I'd like to know what additional steps you think the federal government should take to assist smaller communities like your own, which can, which can face significant hurdles to implement necessary remediation. Uh, thank you, sir, for the question. Um, I, I would say amongst all the challenges we have, I think those funding opportunities are going to be a tremendous benefit to us. Um, we are trying to leverage everything we can, be it working with our council of governments, other agencies, uh, partnerships with other communities around us, trying to leverage better opportunities to secure that funding. Um, we're, we're looking at funding coming to North Carolina right now uh, with some of those funds. We are lobbying to get in excess of the, the posted 3.07%. Um, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of need in North Carolina. I run a, a very small utility. Our water plant's only 2 million gallons a day, which on the grand spectrum is tiny. And we're looking at multiples, tens of millions of dollars and so when you apply this to the much larger facilities, it is, it is a, an enormous amount of money. So I think the, the funding streams that are identified so far are a huge help. I also believe that having 
tangible limits, the MCLs, uh, and having those be precise numbers will go a long way because as we look to go towards kind of the product market um, and potential litigation to recoup costs that we're incurring, having recommendations removed and, and saying that there's an established standard will help us tremendously uh, because it, just like if you're going down the highway or you go around a curve and there's a yellow sign that says recommended speeds 45, well, the police officer's not going to pull you over for going 55. And so we're, we're experiencing that at the contamination level. There's recommendations. All of our numbers are far exceed that. But from a, from a torts claim or other types of product, it, having a precise number would be a great benefit to us. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your service. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Uh, Ms. Norton, your follow, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I very much appreciate this important hearing and, keep, and I note how bipartisan uh, the concern is about water in our country. Uh, this question is for Dr. Sutherland. You've warned that essentially our, our nation has a reactive uh, system uh, with public health waiting for a crisis to occur before we begin monitoring and considering it. Uh, my constituents here in the District of Columbia have only one water source, the Potomac River. Uh, that gives allow, that furnishes water to almost 5 million people in the DC metropolitan area. Meanwhile, there are other metropolitan areas like New York and, and Los Angeles that have a second one and member member are planning a third one. A contamination event in the Potomac River would affect all the major water utilities in this area. And that includes federal infrastructure as well. In your opinion, would having a second source of water supply for the DC metropolitan area help to reduce the threat of high risk man-made chemicals contaminating our surface groundwater. Can you got any idea where we could get a secondary source? Unfortunately, I don't, but that, that is an important, um, you know, backup system you definitely need. I know that the Chesapeake Bay program is doing everything they can uh, to really monitor closely for all kinds of contaminants to make sure the source water for DC's drinking water is as clean as possible, but it's a slow process and very complex. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of other jurisdictions that had only one water supply. Yeah, you know, I, I just don't have the information on that. Uh, that's an area, Madam Chair, that needs to be investigated because that is a clear and present danger. Uh, my next question is for uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, you have described uh, how manufacturers of plastic largely divorce themselves from the issue of recovery. Um, I, I, I'm concerned about how our current system passes the responsibility of plastic waste onto individuals. We know that prevention uh, efforts work better than recovery at reducing impacts on the environment. Uh, and there, of course, are uh, prevention efforts like the recycling. We have that here in the District of Columbia, but we fail to collect millions of tons of plastic waste uh, each year worldwide. Uh, in what ways can government regulation and oversight help shift the duty back to plastic producers and combat misleading claims of recyclability that some use to skirt responsibility for the waste they produce? Uh, thank you, Representative Norton, for that important question. Uh, the key is that products be what we call benign by design that they have built into their um, plan of an afterlife uh, for their product, uh, some infrastructure that can take it back and make it part of uh, what we call a cradle to cradle production system where these uh, 
manufactured products uh, are like uh, biological products in the in the uh, biological world where uh, natural substances uh, turn back into compost and turn into trees. We need the manufactured plastics to come back into industry and become new products. And that infrastructure has not been created by the industries that produce the products. The, the, the cleanup has been externalized. It's, it's much like what our colleagues have been talking about. Uh, the uh, sewage treatment plants have to deal with products they have no uh, role in producing. Uh, we have the municipalities have to deal with the uh, refuse they have no role in creating. So uh, benign by design, uh, redesign of products, uh, an infrastructure as part of the productive process uh, needs to be the mandate, a kind of a thought. Uh, I like to use the term pre-cycle, uh, think before you uh, produce and uh, make recycling part of the program. I understand it begins at the source. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal, uh, fo followed by Mr. Delgado. Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to follow up on some of the very important questions that were just raised by Representative Norton uh, about our broken recycling system. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute, but... Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for your very important testimony. Uh, while these issues are complex, uh, there seems to be a common thread uh, and that the best way to address the toxic chemicals and the pollutants that, is to ensure that they don't get into our environment and waterways in the first place. That's really, and once these materials are produced, um, they burden our waste streams, like our local wastewater facilities, or worse, they pollute our environment and cause harm to our ecosystems and to our bodies. Uh, because it's critically important that we ensure that these contaminants do not enter our waterways in the first place, uh, I included several provisions in my bill, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, to protect our environment, as well as municipal water districts from the downstream impacts. It also really has uh, uh, what is called extended uh, producer responsibility. That is, instead of communities and, and individuals being responsible for the cleanup, because we know a tiny percentage of our recycled material actually gets recycled when we do when we do it. Just a a fraction, I, mean, I think a lower, smaller than 3%. Uh, so this model is just broken, but I wanna talk about what we can do also, in addition to making the producers responsible for it, for the funding of the recycling, for the design of the programs, for the, uh, for the managing of these programs, not leaving it up to the taxpayers uh, to do that. But I'm also interested very much in the proper labeling of plastic. So it's, and in the bill, it includes uh, labeling of plastic wet wipes to ensure that they're not flushed, uh, requirements of, of manufacturers to include microfiber filters in washing machines because there is so much that ends up in our water system from our washing machines. Uh, and uh, ensuring that toxic chemicals uh, by having zero, and one thing, you know, by also having zero uh, discharge of plastic pellets. What's, what we see is that the producers of, of our plastic have, have been unable to discharge millions and millions of plastic pellets into our waterways. There should be zero discharge of plastic pellets. In, uh, and so, uh, we have to ensure that tox and we have to ensure that toxic chemicals are no longer included in the manufacturing of plastic products uh, that we use every day. And so, Captain Moore, I want to go back to your statements that you mentioned before. Can you go into more detail regarding how plastic products like single-use plastic, styrofoam, and others break down into microplastics, nanoplastics? and how these can disrupt our ecosystems or even worse, enter our bodies. Can you 
kind of explain to us a little bit about this process? Uh, in my testimony, I mentioned blowing and foaming agents. Uh, uh, polystyrene is heavier than water, but when it's uh, blown and foamed into make styrofoam, uh, it floats. And it uh, floats because it has millions of tiny bubbles of air uh, that create great insulation. That's why it delivers hot beverages and you don't feel the heat on a thin cup. It's uh, hot on the inside, but you don't feel it on the outside because it's insulated by all this air. Well, when those things get left in the environment, uh, they go through a breakdown process in which those thin walls crack, allowing the item to become waterlogged. It then begins to sink since the styrene is uh, denser than, than water and, and it begins to populate the entire water column. So it undergoes a fracturing process. It becomes smaller particles. Those particles then look like food to marine creatures, gets consumed. And uh, then it goes through the stage of becoming a micro or nanoplastic in which uh, it becomes uh, ingested uh, voluntary, involuntary. Much of the feeding that goes on in the ocean is not uh, looking and, and seeing and tasting and eating, it's, it's a, a, a sweeping uh, vacuum, a vac vacuuming action in which uh, zooplankton have uh, developed uh, ways to uh, sift uh, water and everything was considered to be food, biodegradable, but plastics not being biodegradable get swept up and become non-nutritive. So uh, that uh, is only one aspect of the answer to your question, but since we're out of time, uh, yes. let that be a start. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Captain Moore. And I, I, since I'm out of time, I'm going to yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. Uh, Mr. Delgado, you may proceed. Mr. Delgado? Well, I believe he might not be on. So I guess I will have to uh, uh, go to myself. I, I will ask Dr. Huffing, your testimony states that uh, chemicals need to be proven safe before being put on the market. Similarly, most of you agree the position of the ranking member and I that it is more cost effective to prevent these chemicals from entering the environment than to treat them afterward. To all the panel, again, a yes or no would do. Uh, do you agree that more of the burden needs to be placed on those who manufacture or produce these chemicals than to leave the economic and environment responsibility to the public? Panel I'll start. Do. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, absolutely, yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Flellett? Madam Chair, yes. Well, it is very important that we consider this a very uh, not important, critical issue for all of us. And I trust uh, uh, in talking to my colleague, the ranking member, we need to have a follow-up uh, hearing. Do you agree? We should have follow-on hearing with the industry to come and tell us what they're doing about preventing these chemicals from being uh, put out to the general public. Anybody? Yes. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Well, uh, then we... Uh, too many unknowns of, of the impact right now because some, a lot of these are not regulated. And my concern is too many cancers have been prevalent the last, I would say, two generations. Uh, 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 the last 20 years is just unbearable. Uh, and we also must have the agents come together for quicker action and also provide funding to be able to help the community, small communities deal with it. So we propose the next meeting, we'll, that'll be on the uh, horizon, I hope. Uh, I think Mr. Rouser and I agree that it's important enough to be able to clarify some of the questions that were brought up today. I uh, am now closing because I'm asking for unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such a time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. 
and unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses, please witness any additional information presented to us to be included in the record of today's hearing and without objection, so ordered. Uh, I would suggest to all the members, if you have any ideas for the uh, next meeting that I would like to hold, and I think Mr. Russell agrees with me, uh, please send them to us. I would like to thank all my witnesses very profusely for their insight and their testimony today. Then if no other members have anything to add, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.